Studios of British Muslim TV here in Wakefield with this week's edition of Questions with me, your host, Mohammed Shafiq. We're broadcasting on Sky Channel 752 and across social media at the handle British Muslim TV. Wherever you are joining us from around the world, a very warm welcome. Now, we want you to comment on the big stories we're covering tonight. Call us now on 01924. 231083 your messages on the WhatsApp number, which is on the screen now. And if you're watching this on Facebook, good evening. Post your comments in the chat box and we'll read some of them on air later. Now, tonight, Charlie will be heading to Plainfield in New Jersey to, in the United States to talk uh, to a representative of Care USA about tackling Islamophobia across the United States and the rise of far right Indian extremism. Uh, in not just in New Jersey, but across uh, the United States and North America. <coughs> Sorry, I've got a bit of a cough, so I do apologise if I'm coughing during the programme. We then head to Rochdale and talk to Greater Manchester Tenants Union Chair Mark Slater uh, and President of the British Association of Behavioural and Cogenitive uh, Psychotherapy, Psychanaz, where we reflect on the appalling death of two-year-old Awab Isaac. He was a child who was let down and ignored, and the, and the agencies ignored the cries of help that went to Rochdale Borough White Housing. The coroner said they'd repaired, that had, sorry, the coroner said that had Rochdale, Rochdale Borough White Housing repaired the flood in which Awab was staying, he would still have been alive today. As part of Islamophobia Awareness Month, we then head to London and talk to Billy Kusi Savage and Hassan Juri uh, from the Muslim Council of Britain in their, about their report. It's titled Proudly Black and Muslim. Uh, poignant that we are just finished Black History Month in October. We now have Islamophobia Awareness Month and we'll talk more about that report and continue that conversation that we have the best example, do we not, of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet والسلام, was the best example of equality. That great Sahabi, Sayyidina Bilal radiallahu ta'ala knew. He could have picked the most prominent, affluent Arab to get on the top of the Kaaba and to do the Adhan, but he didn't. He picked Hazrat Bilal, one because of his piety and, and his status and his humbleness, but two, to also send a message to that generation of Sahaba, but also to all generations until the end of time, that you can't truly be a Muslim. You cannot truly do justice to your faith unless you are committed to an anti-racist agenda. And that means believing in equality, whatever your background, and confronting that racism wherever we see it, whether it be in our masajids, in our Muslim organizations, or whether it be in society in general. It's our Islamic duty to stand up against that injustice. I'm reminded of the verse from the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, he commands us to stand up and take a stance against injustice. Qibla Mufti Saab uh, in his Ask the Alim program uh, would obviously give you the religious perspective on this. But the story I take from it is very simple. That Islam commands us to stand up against injustice regardless of the consequences, regardless who it's against. The verse goes on to say, even if it's against your clan, even if it's against your family, take a stance, be proud to speak up and raise your voice. That, my dear brothers and sisters, is what our faith is all about. And the importance that whatever our background, that we recognize that there are still elements of anti-black racism that exists within our community. And that's got to be called out, 
It's got to be eradicated. Because if we are truly Muslim, as I said earlier, if we are truly Muslim, then we go back to the best example of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, which was, he was, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, he was the person, may Allah shower immense blessings upon his beautiful court in Medina al Munawira. He was the blessed personality that demonstrated 1400 years ago that there was no difference between a black man and a white man. He established the first anti-racist society. Do you remember his last sermon where he said there was no difference between a black man and a white man, between an Arab and a non-Arab? The only way there is a difference is their amal, their character, and their deeds. Brothers and sisters, as we reflect in this month of Islamophobia Awareness Month, what is it that we can do to tackle the issues of Islamophobia. Now often for those of us who are privileged enough to be on television as presenters or commentators and the mainstream media over many, many years, I've been able to have the honor of not just speaking up to defend Islam and the Muslim community, but to actually tackle those issues. It's not just up to us, it's up to you at home as well. Islamophobia is something it's an evil that has been perpetuated by the narrative in the media, by right-wing, xenophobic, far-right politicians and representatives of our media. So how do we confront that? How do we, as British Muslims, here on British Muslim TV, how do we confront that? How do we tackle that particular issue? I often say in the events that I uh, visit and have the honor of participating across the country, that we have to become better ambassadors for Islam. We have to become better ambassadors for Islam in our character. And as Mufti Sa was saying earlier, we are not those that should be involved in the takfir, taking the people out of the fold of Islam. We should be the people bringing people into Islam through our character. That when somebody looks at a good deed that we do, looks at our character, they say, if this is the quality and the greatness of a follower, can you imagine the status and the example of the person that this person is following? And that's the message of Islam. Islam is a message of peace. It's a message of character. We live in a very diverse society here in the UK and around Europe. Our neighbours are from many ethnicities and many backgrounds and many religions and those of none. And it's through that character that we begin to impress upon wider society that we are no different from them. Yes, we are very passionate and hard believers in our faith because that for us is very important. It's the most important thing in our lives, is it not? And yes, we are sinful. Yes, we are not worthy of the mercy and the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah loves you. Allah loves us all. And that's why he continues to shower his blessings upon us. He gives us rizq. He blesses us with good wealth, a good family, children, a good community. And he makes us, all of us, responsible for the actions that we take. And if we were to change our character, if we were to change our interaction with the non-Muslims to a positive thing, we begin to change people's perceptions of Islam. There's a story from a few years ago of an old Jewish woman. It's a true story. She was living uh, next door to, um, she was living in a, in a terraced house. Her children had moved around the world and settled in different parts of the world and whilst she was able to look after herself she was fine a muslim family moved next door and as she deteriorated in age and in health they took it upon themselves to look after her to do a shopping to check up on her uh, in the morning 
to make sure that her bins were wheeled out. And when she got seriously ill, instead of being put up in a home, a care home or in hospital, she was able to stay in her home and looked after by this Muslim family. And so much so that they were able to look after her in her final moments. And her children, Jewish community, her children were so in awe of this family that they pay tribute to that family on her funeral because they wanted to acknowledge the huge sacrifices and contribution and dedication and care this Muslim family give to that neighbour. They, by their actions, one demonstrated that they were good human beings, two, they changed the perception of Islam and Muslims in the eyes of that Jewish woman and her family. When the children couldn't get back to the UK to look after their mother, they were able to look after her. Not for any financial gain, not for any inheritance or whatever else you th th people are sometimes obsessed with, but actually because they wanted to do a good deed. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam was sent as a mercy for the whole of humanity. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ is the verse in the Qur'an. Where have we changed our character to make a huge difference to the people that we live amongst? To change their perception of Islam, not through what we see in the media, not what we see uh, from people talking about Islam or hating Islam, but actually through that character we change perceptions. Yes, there are a hardcore people who are inherently are racist and Islamophobic. They're engaged in physical and verbal abuse of Muslims, mostly Muslim women. But actually, that is something that we need to reflect on. And in, if you learn anything in Islamophobia Awareness Month, I hope we'll be able to change our character we're going to take a very quick break. When we come back, inshallah, we'll continue with the program. Don't be going anywhere after these short, important messages. Assalamu alaikum. राशन मिल जो अस खाई जैमें हर शे मौजूद आए उनमें थाव भी किचन जो सजाई अस अं अस भाइर की मेहरबानी आनमें बाल्टियन बदना अला इन भाइर के अना गंज दींद अस मदद कह إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستهديه. رسول الله حبيب الله. What does it mean to follow the Prophet peace be upon him? رسول الله رسول الله. Be content with that which you have been given. You will be the richest of people. رسول الله. Find your perfect match. Join 3 million members worldwide. Download the singlemuslim.com app for free now. Welcome back to Questions with me, Mohamed Shafiq. I hope my reflections on Islamophobia my Awareness Month give us all an opportunity to reflect on our character and our behaviour um, if, I, if you've learned something from this, 
I thank you. Please pray for me and my family. Um, if I've offended you, um, which is never my intention, please forgive me. Right, so if you want to share your thoughts on the program tonight, 01924-23103. Messages on WhatsApp, post on social media. We'll read some of the comments of, on air. Now, last week we had the extraordinarily sad news that Ayab Isaac, a two-year-old child who comes from my hometown in Rochdale, who was born to refugees from Sudan, uh, was living in a flat that had mauled and he was... He was affected by that. And yet when he turned to the people whose job it was to protect him, those institutions failed him. In this case, Rochdale Borough White Housing is an arm's length body that was responsible, that was set up to provide and run the housing stock for Rochdale Council. And their job was to make sure that those homes were safe for human consumption that the repairs that were needed were done and that people's health and well-being was helped. But the reality is that didn't happen. The reality is, as we talked about Black History Month and the inherent institutional racism that exists in some parts of our communities, that will be something um, that we're going to reflect on now. Uh, we'll talk in more detail um, about the case which I want to talk to you about. But as I said, 01924-231-083. If you uh, want to share your thoughts about the death of Ayab Isaac, he was too beautiful a child. You've seen the pictures. He was in the news uh, very much over the last uh, few uh, weeks. And really, really important that we also take it upon ourselves to reflect on what happened, why it happened, and to make sure that it never happens again. I think that's really, really important. And if you want to share your thoughts, as I said, 01924 231083. Pick up the phone um, and inshallah we'll take some of your comments, your reflections um, on this important program. You're watching Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq, live on British Muslim TV, Sky Channel 752, from our studios here in Wakefield. Um, when Faisal Abdullah fled Sudan for a better life, he was placed in accommodation in Rochdale. He was looking to a bright future. His wife, Aisha Amini, joined him and they had their first child, Awab Isaac. Awab sadly died when he was two. He lived in a Rochdale Borough Wising House um, flat where he suffered prolonged exposure to mold, which led to his death. The parents continuously complained to Rochdale Borough White Housing about the mold and the impact it was having on Awab's health, but their cries for help was ignored and ridiculed. Last week at the Rochdale Coroner's Court, Senior Coroner Joanne Kersley said, I'm sure I'm not alone in having thought, how could this happen? How in the UK in 2020 does a two-year-old child die from exposure to mould in his house? The levelling up and community secretary, Michael Gove MP, said there is no way a child in a house with such damp and mould can be considered to be a decent home. He said, and I quote this tragedy, should never have occurred. The standards the Housing Association should have upheld have been breached, and that is why I've asked the guy in charge to come to this department to explain himself. That man the Secretary of State referred to was Gareth Swarbrick. He refused, after the coroner uh, judgment, he refused to resign. But on Saturday, moments before the vigil in Rochdale was happening, he was forced out by the Rochdale Borough White Housing Board. Now, Mark Slater is the chair of the Greater Manchester Tenants Union. Um, he's joined us, and hopefully after the break, Saika Naz will be with us as well. But Mark Slater, thank you so much uh, for joining us, and thank you so much for all the work that you've been doing. Tell us, tell us what's your memory of uh, Awab and what his family have been through? Well, thanks for inviting me, Mohammed. You've done a great summary there of the circumstances of this little boy's death. And um, Awab will never be forgotten in this town. And I understand that you're from, am, you're yeah. from Rochdale. Yeah. Born and, and bred. Yeah, well, this is a family that came to Rochdale and they were looking for some safety. They were looking for some support. And they came to this town, which, um, as a Rochdaleian myself, I recognise is a town that's full of, full of uh, support and it's full of compassion. Um, we're a vibrant multicultural community here, 
And I think we pride ourselves on the ability to take people in and take people to our hearts. And the fact that the Ishak family were, were let down by uh, by the, the community, although not directly, obviously directly, by RBH, um, but the, the fact that they feel um, let down and that there was um, no support is really painful for the the wider community to accept. Um, but it does it does raise a lot of issues about RBH. Yeah. Um, um, and sorry, uh, Mark, before we get into the issues around RBH, because we've got lots of time to do that, just tell us who are Greater Manchester Tenants Union and what, what sort of work do you do? Well, I'm I'm the Rochdale uh, the Rochdale chair of, of the branch. We've got we've got branches all over uh, Greater Manchester, Moss Side, Levenshume, Stockport, uh, and some new branches opening up in Middleton, and we support tenants, both private and um, uh, social housing. We we help support them with um, with complex with bad landlords, and we support them with that and. And taking uh, and taking action against landlords, but we also support them. We also support them with um, Section Twenty One evictions, mm. the no fault evictions, and things like that. We work very closely with Greater Manchester Law uh, Law Centre, and we provide, excuse me, we provide um, support and take landlords to court, and we provide defences if anybody is being threatened with a, a no fault eviction. If anybody's living in a property uh, that is in a bad condition, like uh, the Ashet Asher families, um, then we we take action against landlords as well, in concert with Greater Manchester Law Centre. Yeah, and and in this particular case, as I said, Rochdale Borough Wide Housing was created as an arm's length body. Um, Rochdale Council created this body and handed over their housing stock, their council flats and council homes to that particularly arm's length body, what do you make of that decision? Because, you know, that decision to, to, to give it to and create this new institution was supposed to make it easier for the tenants, but that didn't turn out in terms of RBH's case, did it? It didn't. I think you've got to take this in context, though, and you've got to, everything's easy with hindsight. Back at the time, I think it was 2010, back at the time when this, this stock transfer was done. The council made the decision to to uh, transfer the stock to RBH, and the big de deciding factor in that was there was a debt to central government of 148 million pounds, um, and that and transferring the stock out of out of co council um, control, out of council ownership, meant that that debt was wiped off by central government. And as a as a member of this community, you've got to think that not having to service that debt meant that that would free up more money for the budgets for um, all the, the the services that uh, a council will provide, education and roads and the, everything else. So the councillors at that time took was what was probably in context the right decision. With hindsight, a lot of the councillors that that were involved in that decision regret it no they regret it um but it was a very difficult decision for them to make uh, and it uh, as we can see it's turned out um it's turned out not to be the case that uh, it hasn't turned out as positive as, poss as possible um and does does the greater manchester tennis uh, union have representation in terms of rbh the board because the board is appointed and uh, is there representatives from the tenants union no, not at all. Um, is that is that what was missing? Well, what was missing was elected representation. We did have we did have two of um, we did we did have um, two um, two councillors on the representative body. That was who is now the housing portfolio, Danny Danny Meredith, Danny Meredith, yeah, and Sultan Ali, yeah, um, all the good council. friends of the campaign and good good friends of um, the Seven Sisters in Rochdale. And because they opposed RBH, um, they were asked to leave the representative body purely because they had a different opinion to the way that RBH was going. These are elected elected members and voicing the, the views 
as elected members of the community. We're about two minutes before the break, and I just wanted to ask, you know, you put that beautiful vigil that I had the privilege of being at um, on Saturday. There was a huge turnout as well. There was lots of love for the um, uh, Awab Isak family. Um, what does it mean to you that you were able to put that vigil on and to highlight, you know, the solidarity and love that exists in the town for that family and what they've been through? It meant an awful lot, Mohammed. It really did, because... We weren't really expecting the family to be there, but regardless of that, we wanted to show the family that there was a community in Rochdale that did care, that RBH were not representative of the people of the general community in Rochdale. There were people that did care that a little two-year-old boy lost his life in dreadful, dreadful circumstances. The horrific way that that little boy died and not being able to breathe. All of us that are parents or grandparents with, with children that age, can just realise and, and accept how horrific that must be. This little boy died of a cardiac arrest with fungus in his blood and in his, his lungs. And it is just absolutely abhorrent that this is somebody's fault. Um, so we wanted, with the vigil, we wanted to show the uh, Ishak family that there are people in Rochdale that care, that we are really, really sorry. And this town, in speaking to Danny Meredith, this town will never forget our lab. There will be there will be some lasting memorial to that little boy, and it won't bring him back. But we won't forget him. That's the sort of community we are. Mark, thank you so much uh, for joining us. I know you're going to stay with us. Uh, Saika Naz is also going to be joining us in the next uh, segment of the program. Uh, Mark's later there, who is the chair, the Rochdale chair of the Greater Manchester's Tenants Union. Um, as I said, they had a fantastic vigil on Saturday, and had the privilege of being there. And the thing that stood out for me was that there was lots of love from a town called Rochdale. But was that too late? And when we look at the demonization of migrants and asylum seekers and refugees, what have we done to be there for that community? We're going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about the circumstances of the case of Ayab Isak and what now for social housing. We'll take a very quick break when we come back. We'll continue that very important conversation and take some of your thoughts. Please join us on the other side of this. Find your perfect match. Join 3 million members worldwide. Download the singlemuslim.com app for free now. असांते मी हवा से आलाडा असांग डाटो परेशान थे आसे असांते बोर्ड अच्छी वही घर कम बे घर थी आसे असांज जो जायूं कीरी पायूं कुछ जनर रहे हो असांज जो सक्खना सेरा वाटी असांने किताऊं होता हूं बच्चा असांज जो मजूरी कंदान तक खाई दाऊं जे नकंदान तक असांज का डिचलो भी ना बारी दाऊं असां सां ये मजबूरी हूँ जेको असां खाई दासे जेमे हर शय मौजूद आहे उन में थावा भी किचन जा सजाई असां के दिना त असां जे बायरन जी मेहरबानी आ उन में बाल्टियों ने बदना है ने अल्लाह इन बायरन के अन्या गंजली दो असां जी मदद कंदा Assalamualaikum. Welcome back to Questions with me, Mohamed Shafiq. Thank you so much for joining us. I've got a bit of a cold, so if I do um, cough during the program, I do apologise in advance. 
uh, we, we are joined to remember um, a beautiful child um, who died unnecessarily. And we're going to reflect now on the circumstances around that. Mark Slater, as you know, is the chair of the Greater Manchester Tenants Union Rochdale branch and Psychonaz is the president of the British Association for Behavioural Cogenitive Psychotherapies. And she's been supporting families in Rochdale. I'm pleased to say Mark is back with us and Psyche is also joining us to reflect on the death of Awab. Uh, welcome back to the programme, both of you. Uh, it's, it's very sad too that we're having to have this conversation. Um, Mark, tell us, what do you know about Awab and, and what the family has been through? Well, I know that it, uh, they, they moved into the um, flat on Freehold in 2016. I know that they first reported the uh, the damp, I think, four or five years ago. And I know that they they tried relentlessly to, to try and get the, the mould and the damp uh, fixed by um, RBH. Uh, but RBH, I, I forget some of the phrases that the RBH um, RBH used. But I know that the inquest said the inquest said um, the workers, the RBH workers, assumed the family were carrying out ritual bathing. I think it's just disgraceful, and we know what words we can use for this sort of assumption. Um, and it was just basic mould that is throughout that estate. Um, it's it's not it, it isn't the only um, it isn't the only the only property there, but they reported it four or five years ago, and then it was um, Awab was struggling with his breathing for three years before he died. It is just horrific, absolutely yeah. horrific. Um, um, just it, just on that, I mean, we did ask Watcher Borough White Housing if they wanted to come on the program tonight. They declined, but they did post early on yesterday. Um, about the um, issue of institutional racism, um, the, the, the bathing, um, and they, they tweeted this yesterday and they said, we did make assumptions about lifestyle and we accept that we got that wrong. We'll be implementing further training across the whole organisation. We abhor racism. We abhor racism in any shape or form. Um, and we know that we have a responsibility to all in the communities. I mean, to you, um, Saike, what's your reflections on the death of Awab and RBH's comments about um, the fact that they now accept that their, their assumptions uh, were wrong? Um, I think it's um, deeply upsetting. I think um, what we know of the Muslim community is when there's a funeral, somebody dies, it's a whole community affair. It's not something that's just mourned by the family the community comes together and i feel like the family has been robbed of the opportunity of the community to come and support them in their time of need uh, to go through that grieving process with them and in terms of the um language that's been used you know we've um we've been actually involved in a couple of campaigns so no mark from one of the housing campaigns so we've been going since 2016 and 17. So some of the issues that we've been raising are long-standing issues. And at that point, I think the Housing Association could have stopped and listened to us. Um, you know, I've spoken about the impact on residents' mental health, for example, and just having that humility back in 2016, 17, potentially could have prevented this from happening. And for me, I think what makes it really um, upsetting, it's deeply upsetting for me, is that knowing that the time we were raising awareness about this particular housing association, that Awab's family were sort of crying out for help, and nobody pieced the two things together. Mm. And, and I appreciate that's probably more of a systemic issue where people and agencies aren't talking to each other. But there's a human impact here, which, you know, long after the media leaves, it's going to be left with Awab's family. And I think as a community in Rochester, we feel like we've let the family down. Um, quite a few of us are quite active in the community and we had no idea this was going on. And it makes me feel like it's trying to, uh, RPH are trying to brush this under the carpet. Um, so yeah, their choice of words around making assumptions is what I call racism, because that is what stopped uh, Awab's family from getting the help. So okay. blaming it in the individual rather than thinking of it as an, in a systemic issue yeah. is racism. And that's what we call structural racism. Yeah, we do. And, and we're going to reflect on that um, as we get on the programme. But Mark, this is not an isolated case. I know of a number of families that I've spoken to on the Freehold Estate uh, in the last few days who are saying they 
their flats are also in the same situation. Um, how is the Tenants' Union helping some of those families? Well, helping them on a one-to-one -one basis. But can I just come back to something that you you highlighted there, Mohammed, and that is sure. RBH's statement about understanding that, that uh, mistakes were made. I think retrospective apologies are all very well and good. But what this little boy and this little boy's family need is they need justice. A retrospective apology is just platitude. <laughs> it reflects, in my opinion, it re reflects the arrogant nature of... Um, the the board in general and the organization this little boy's family deserve justice they deserve somebody to be held accountable and i don't just mean gareth swarbrick resigning or or being sacked i do beg your pardon being sacked do, do, you, know, you just mark on that i mean you we were at the vigil on saturday we and the news broke as that vigil started mm -hmm. um do you think that was done deliberately timed for pr reasons as the same time as your uh, vigil was happening, the media was there, uh, and this story got, you know, announced just as you were starting your vigil. Um, I'd like to think so. I'd like to think that was part of the pressure on Gareth Swalbrick to actually, or the board, to um, to realise that there was a strength and a depth of feeling in the community that couldn't um, couldn't um, support. Gareth Swalbrick anymore, but it, again, you come back to this arrogant and um, patronising approach that this this organisation have to the community, and Gareth Swalbrick was a sac is a sacrificial lamb. The board is still in place, and that board were party to all the decisions that Gareth Swalbrick make, made, and they voted for those decisions. Mm. They were managing the, the actual guys who went out there to. Um, to, to, to look and resolve mould and damp issues. They were part of that organisation and they are not fit for purpose to have flat. You're, you're quite right, Mo. I've been out on freehold as well on this estate and I've been in those houses and I've seen the disgraceful conditions that these houses are in. But the problem, the, the real inherent problem is that the, the lack of social housing, and it's not just Rochdale, but in Rochdale particularly, the lack of social housing means that people are under pressure to accept a home, any home. And housing associations like RBH take advantage of that in terms of their responsibility of maintenance and, um, and yeah. the lack of care and attention. Um, and that's that's just letting the, let, letting the tenants down. Yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to ask you, um, Saika, there's, there's reports from ex-employees, but also whistleblowers who've spoken to the media in the last few days that there was a toxic culture in Rochdale Borough White Housing um, and they were pushed to find ways to reduce cost um, um, so that they could, uh, you know, um, do that. Um, and that might have been the consequences. What do you make of that toxic culture? I mean, it's obviously something which RBH is not commenting on. Uh, they refused to comment to us uh, earlier on today. Uh, what's your reaction to that toxic culture, how ex-employees and current employees are talking about that culture? Um, I think it's something that we really need to speak about because we've been talking and focusing a lot on uh, impact on residents living in unsafe uh, properties. And on that point, I just want to say Seven Sisters has wonderful flats. They don't have damp, but they're closed because RBH wanted to demolish them. So there's good quality homes that are ready literally for residents to move into. I really hope somebody sort of jumps on this. But in terms of uh, employees, I think we have to think about the workplace environment and the culture and this whole idea of having psychological safety so if you feel safe you feel secure you feel able to speak out you feel able to speak up and be heard um but if the toxic culture if it is, is an organization where the culture is closed off and you're it's punitive and it doesn't feel safe to speak up which i am assuming is what's happened here if people don't want to reveal their identities but they want to share um, how bad it's been for them. Do you know, there's a whole idea around moral injury. Do you know, when you're doing things that are against your values and your principles, um, that impacts on employees as well. So what I'd really like to see is some support put in place for um, current and ex-employees to create a separate space for them to go and speak about their experiences. Because I would assume most of the people who are working for Rochdale Borough Wide Housing are from within Rochdale. Um, and coming from Rochdale myself, I, I do worry about their well-being as well. Yeah. 
I, I, I'm, I'm a, I mean, Mark, I mean, obviously people who work in the public sector, whether it be the local authority or central government, they have uh, whistleblower policies, they have a whistleblower hotline, and there are ways to protect people who want to raise things. Was that missing? Is that missing in sort of the third sector, in, in, in sort of hands-off housing associations like RBH? I think it, it would have been, I think it would have been good if before this this had happened, I, th I think it would have been good if some of the people that, that work for um, RBH could have come forward. Um, but I respect the people that, that have actually come come forward since this this uh, tragic incident. Um, and uh, I respect them for the for the bravery in coming in coming forward. But it, as as Saika quite rightly pointed out, um, the, these issues are inbuilt in this organisation, and they need they need highlighting. And this board is in, incapable of of dealing with the issues that there are inherent in that organisation. Um, Saika, I mean, I. I said in reaction last week that we as the Muslim community failed, that these people lived amongst us, you know, that very diverse, you know, Tweedle Street, Milkstone, Deeplish Ward, predominantly Muslim areas. Where were we? Where were the mosque? Where were the charity organizations? Where were the community organizations? And I, I just, I just, I just feel we all, okay, I'm, you know what I'm going to do? Because it's a really important question and I feel it might be a bit rushed. So if you stay there, Mark's going to stay with us. We're going to take a very quick break and we'll assess on that. And that for me is the big issue. As again, as I said at the top of the program, our character. How are we as an ummah failing that there is a family living in such abject environment and has no support? is Muslim. I mean, it doesn't matter if they're Muslim or not. There's really, we should be focused on humanity. But the fact that they were Muslim and they didn't know where to turn. But where were our mosques? Where were our organisation? Where were our counsellors? Where were our community activists? It's a really important question. I don't want to rush it. And that's why we're going to take that question on the top of a programme. We're remembering Awab Ishaq, a two -year -old, beautiful two-year-old child uh, who brutally died uh, in a mauled flat in Rochdale um, and the coroner judgment and reflecting uh, on his case. It was on my first trip to Pakistan when I was 12 that I saw kids my own age whose backs bowed under the weight of carrying water containers made me realise how fortunate I was. As I got older, I became more involved to improve the plight of orphans in my home village. Eventually, in 2009, I founded the charity Penny Appeal. Teamwork really does make the dream work because in a few years, we became a British Muslim movement. Our donors saved lives, fed the homeless, built water wells, mosques, schools, hospitals. We innovated and took movies, comedy and music tours into our communities. By 2021, we impacted the lives of people across 56 countries and provided 49 million meals, alhamdulillah. It was the donors and the team that made Penny Peel surpass all my expectations but it wasn't without struggles because I learned some lessons the hard way. So I hope you don't mind if I tell you the whole story of Penny Appeal. Small change, big difference. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ask on WhatsApp any questions, any recommendations, any advice we sometimes fall into the trap of the devil, of shaitan, and unfortunately lose our way.
Welcome back to Questions with me, Mohamed Shafiq. We're reflecting on the death of Awab Isaac in Rochdale with Mark Slater and Saika Naz. Um, let's open the lines if you want to share your thoughts on this. 01924 231083. Um, so, Saika, we were just reflecting that question uh, just before the break around where were the Muslim community? Where were our councillors? Where were our mosques? Where was the institutions that we saw rely on in Rochdale and that do some good work? Where were they? in regards to these refugees? And, and that's a really good question. And it's a question that's often um, uh, I've reflected upon myself because when I became involved with the lower failing, and I really would ask people to go and see lower failing. It was one of the most deprived estates in Europe at one point and in Britain as well. Go see what's happening there. It's being destroyed. They've demolished half of it. You can't demolish poverty. It needs infrastructure, not demolition. And 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 then getting involved with Seven Sisters at the same time as well. I used to run after people. You know, I was working outside of, of Rochdale and I'm chasing people, whether it's councillors, local community leaders, people in the community. And in the end, when we first started with Seven Sisters, there's about four of us, four of us. But somehow we managed to get to the media and it was... So I, I personally have been upset with the community of Rochdale because I've also been involved with the multi-faith partnership, for example, and we do the Holocaust Memorial Service. So we're, I'm in the community. There's wonderful people that I meet there, people who inspire my work in mental health and inequalities. But when it comes to the town, I think we need something that binds us together, that connects us. And it needs to be possibly, I think it needs to be thinking about what our shared values are, regardless of what background, culture, religion you're from. And in Islam, you advocate for the person who's oppressed or who has less. And I think it's using those Islamic values that are universal to bring people together. And actually, you know, what you can do right now is think this should never happen again. We need to come together. We need to create a scrutiny body. We need to teach people and youngsters how to think critically, evaluate information. I mean, I just use my cognitive behavior therapy skills, to be fair, mm. when I've been supporting residents, but also finding our voices. The working class people need to find their voices. How do we support those deprived communities to have a voice, to be represented on boards? So there's so much potential here in the town. And I think what we need is somebody to come together. And often what we see is people sort of trying to bid for pockets of funding here and there and it becomes a little bit sort of insular and political and about survival and actually what we really need is to think on a higher order level which is what our shared values are and why don't we have confidence to speak up and why is it that external people will come in and do what they've done and actually it was unchallenged for a very long time yeah um, so my my challenge back to the Muslim not just the Muslim community the community of Rochdale is that you know, you have to be actively engaged in the community. I know Islamophobia is rife and people shy away, but we have to be in these positions. So me being president of the British Association of Behavioural Cognitive Psychotherapies, is I've got an amazing support network around me, but, you know, there's not many Muslims around. Yeah. So, you know, we have to think about having aspirations for ourselves, our local communities, whether that's Muslim or non-Muslim. We have to go and learn, take knowledge, bring it back and empower other people. So... There's a lot to consider here, I think. Yeah, and it's a conversation that we're, we're committed to continuing here on British Muslim TV. Um, we're going to reach out to representatives of those Muslim organisations and get them in and see, uh, uh, you it know, has to. shine a light. It has to uh, lead that. to very important. action, though. Um, it has to lead. It has to be driven, to driven by the needs action. of the community and the, the people that you're supporting. Um, so, um, Mark, let me ask you this. You know, you spent the best part of last week in the aftermath of the coroner's uh, ruling calling for Gareth Swarbrick to resign. He refused and then he was sacked. What else are you calling for? Because it's not just about one person, is it? Absolutely not. Um, we, are, we are calling at the moment for the rest of the board um, to, um, to be dismissed. We're, we're talking about a restructure of the organisation. Um, just back to a point that you made about the councillors, the councillors have a responsibility that's absolutely right but I, I do know how hard councillors work and they respond and react in my in my experience they respond and react to everything that's brought to their attention we have three excellent ward councillors here on uh, on on Scotland ward and uh, I know that um, 
Fessel Rana is one of the uh, one of the councillors here, and he put his casework diary uh, on Facebook the other day, and it was two hundred cases, I think, that he's, that he's done and cleared off within the past. I think it was six months, uh, and they do respond and they do react, but the the overall. But they um, haven't in this case, have they? They haven't in this case. They they were not aware of these mouldy flats. They have not reached out to these refugees and these communities. And if I they're think, a councillor for the whole ward, where are they? Yeah, I think that's fair comment, Mo. Um, but they can only respond to things that are actually reported to them. And if they weren't... Reported Can't they be proactive? Them, sorry? Can't they be proactive? I just, I'm just, um, I was talking to one of the councillors, I'm not going to name him, I was talking to one of the councillors who t told me that the day before he'd gone and did a walk around the flat. Um, he's a relatively new councillor. Uh, we're going to get him on the programme uh, in a couple of weeks. But I just get a sense you should know your community. And yeah. if you don't know your community, then you're failing. Well, I know that. I can only speak about our, our own ward in this yeah. case. We've got three, we've got three really active councillors with Fessel Rana, Iram uh, Rana and uh, Amber, Amber Nisa as well. And they're always on our estate. Uh, Psycho mentioned our estate, which is the Seven Sisters. And the Seven Sisters, they are always on our estate. They run, they run regular surgeries. In fact, we've got our own community room on here, and we're talking about having surgeries there. They're very active, and they're very uh, proactive in doing that. Um, but just back to uh, little Awab and, um, and his death, it, the, the, the really sad thing about this is that it was avoidable. Mm. The really iconic photograph of Awab on a piece of grass with his little yellow shirt on and he's smiling and playing in the sunshine. In the background of that photograph are two of the seven sisters. RBH are currently holding 400 apartments in those blocks empty in preparation to demolish. Those flats are dry and warm. The Ishak family could have been in one of those flats, dry and warm, and our Abishak would have been here today. And that's the real sadness of this tragedy. Yeah. It was completely avoidable, and that little boy could have been playing in his flat tonight. Um, <coughs> sorry, I apologise for my cough. Um, Psyche, they suffer... It's not just a physical injury that these families suffer. They suffer mental health, the trauma, you know, for the parents who have not been able to protect their child. Um, would have a massive impact on them mentally. What, what additional support do you think those communities need? Do you know, you need to. When we're thinking about trauma, one of the first things we think about is safety, you know, because if you're feeling unsafe, you know, I can't reassure you, I can't make you feel better. So I have met residents in those flats that have all died in, in, in those blocks. <laughs> We're, not, we're, we're scared of dying. Do you know, my child's scared of dying. I'm scared of dying. We have mould in our flats. And you feel quite helpless. Um, so firstly, I mean, what I'd like to see is those people move to Seven Sisters because those flats aren't mouldy. My understanding is RBH have been going in and removing the electricity. Um, so somebody needs to go quickly assess what the situation is in Seven Sisters. Um, if the electricity has been pulled, rewire it and move those people out as quickly as possible. So physical safety is really important. Um, and the psychological safety is important as well. So bringing services to them, um, they'll need their physical health check uh, completed as well. So what I'm thinking here is we need some funding resources, services really to come in. But with Avab's family is that whilst all this is going on until they don't have justice, it's going to be really difficult for them because even, you know, as we speak now, we're on the 23rd of November, um, it's been going on for over a week now, a couple of weeks, that nobody's been charged, <laughs> you know, nobody's called the organisation negligent. People know he's died because of discrimination. Michael Gove has said it. Um, so where's the justice for this family? So on an individual level, this family absolutely need justice from the law. They also need a safe space at some point, whether it's probably later on, maybe. Um, where, where, do you know where there. they are now? Are they still in the same... My understanding is they left Rochdale and, you know, and I feel really ashamed that we've not been able to protect them and support mm. them in their time of need. And my understanding is then eventually they did end up leaving Rochdale okay. and then to come back to Rochdale must be quite traumatic, traumatic. for them. Again and, again and again and again. again. Um, I, we've got about two minutes left. Um, uh, sorry, we've got about a minute left. 
Mark, I just want to ask you this question. Um, the local council leader is uh, um, Neil Emmett, um, and his, uh, you, you mentioned Daniel uh, Meredith, the housing cabinet member, uh, and, and many of the local councillors are now saying to the government um, that they should bring this housing stock back in-house so that it's got democratic accountability. What, what are your thoughts about that? That's the ideal solution, that one. We would like that. The logistics of it and the funding of it are really complicated, though. To do that, the um, the council would need funding and support from central government to be able to do that. To immediately take on board 16,000 properties from a standing start would need an enormous amount of funding. I know that uh, Michael Gove is in Rochdale tomorrow uh, and he's meeting with uh, council leaders. Um, and, and Danny, Danny Meredith as well, and we hope that they can work something out, something out that means that social housing has a more comprehensive and responsible ownership after tomorrow. Okay, uh, just final comment to you on that, Saika. Michael Gove in Rochdale tomorrow. What, 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 what do you hope he? What, what do you expect? Come and speak to me. I'm here in Rochdale tomorrow from our board meeting, and um, we we'll, can share our. We have a lot of expertise in the in the organisation to think about how do we support residents in more of a trauma informed way because homes are not just homes they are safe spaces and when that's yeah. been compromised that's going to have an impact on somebody's mental health and physical health so what I'd really like to see is if we're really sincere about the communities in Rochdale is let's think of a, an approach that's more trauma informed. Um, so, yeah, we're here tomorrow. OK, well, we'll keep an eye on uh, what Michael Gove uh, says tomorrow. Um, Saika Naz, president of BABCP, um, and Mark Slater, who's the chair of Greater Manchester's Tenants Union uh, in Rochdale branch. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we've sadly uh, reached our, the end of our time together, but I hope, I just want to say this uh, to both of you, that you do some very inspiring work. Um, and, you know, you're doing stuff to keep the name of Awab alive and make sure that it doesn't happen again. Thank you so much for all that you do. Um, and it was a beautiful vigil at the weekend. Uh, we wish you and your families well. Uh, that was Mark Slater, the chair of Greater Manchester's Tennis Union, as I said, and the president of British Association of Behavioural Cognitive uh, Psychotherapies. I hope I got that right. It's quite a mouthful, isn't it? Uh, they were joining us live from Rochdale. Uh, reflecting on the death of two-year-old Awab Isaac. And as I said, let's reflect on that. Right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll reflect on Black History Month. We'll talk about being proud and black and Muslim and talk about the diversity of the British Muslim community. Join us on the other side of this. Are you suffering from hair thinning or hair loss? Luxurious hair growth products use the highest quality, natural ingredients and proven formulas for hair regrowth. Don't believe us? Then look at these results. I've been using the hair serum and shampoo for about three months. Um, my hair's got a lot thicker and uh, really recommend it. Get 10% off today using code BMTV. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Single Muslim Live here on British Muslim TV. Before you get into that relationship, you need to be completely content with yourself. Areas in our, in our lives that need adjusting and that adjusting leads to healing. You using your emotional intelligence to understand other people. These are really tough topics but really needed to be spoken about. Looking for the perfect place to host your next event? Gifto's Lahore Karai Banquet is here to make your event mesmerizing for you and for your guests. Catering for up to 180 people with extravagant ambience for all kinds of events like birthdays, weddings, henna, family function or anniversaries. Indulge your taste buds with authentic and freshly prepared Pakistani cuisine on site and delight your guests with elegance. For booking, contact Gifto's Lahore Karai. over 100 years of expertise. Here at Kingswell Watt Solicitors, we cover a range of legal services, including immigration law, family law, and much more. Get in touch on 01924 461 236, or alternatively, email us at inquiries at kingswellwatts.co.uk.
Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq. Now, if you have been affected by the conversation we just had about Awab Isak and you need additional support, please do log on to British Muslim TV, uh, BritishMuslim.tv slash support, where you find more information. Uh, please don't suffer in silence. Do reach out. There's lots of help and support available uh, in the community. Let's move on to our final uh, topic and guest. When you think of the British Muslim community, you, we think about diversity and culture and a unity in faith not seen in many other faiths. Now, black Muslim communities make up around 10% of the British Muslim community. Their lived experience includes racism and Islamophobia, both from outside the Muslim community and, sadly, from within, as I was reflecting at the top of the programme. The Proudly Muslim and Black Project is a collaboration between the Muslim Council of Britain, Everyday Muslim, and several other partner organisations. They want to promote inclusivity and they want to act as a platform for existing initiatives. They really want to create a hub for resources and materials uh, on this subject area and bring together academics, practitioners to highlight the key areas that need to be addressed in relation to history, social impact, youth and community cohesion. Now, Billy Kisi Savage is the chairperson of the MCB Proudly Black and Muslim, and Hassan Jodi is the Deputy Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Britain. I'm pleased to say they're both joining us live on British Muslim TV from London. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, a very warm welcome to the programme. Great to have this conversation. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you so much. Um, how do you pronounce your name first to make sure we get it right? It's Blikis, but as a Yoruba woman. Yeah, it's Blikis, but as a Yoruba woman, it's Blikis. So. <laughs> okay, that's easy. Blikis is easy. Yes, excellent. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank uh, you. First of all, tell us, uh, why was it important for this report to be compiled? First of all, I'd like to appreciate the organization for inviting us on behalf of MCB. I'd like to thank you for inviting us to give us the platform to talk about this. Why is it important? It's very important for us as black Muslims to be able to document our lived experience, to be able to showcase that we're not just we're not just black, but there are things we've done in the past that is important to the community. We're, we're documenting our lived experience, our achievement. I mean, in, in parliament, there are about 18 Muslim MPs. So that is something that people do not know about. And it's important for us to be able to showcase the achievements of black Muslims. And it, 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 we talk about racism, we talk about issues of uh, discrimination that affect black Muslims. In COVID, you remembered the Muslim community, the black Muslim community was more impacted than anybody. And of, of course, the report was initiated before COVID, but it goes to show that the report is important because we're able to provide data in terms of across the field of different um, sports, education, how mm. the Muslim people are thriving. That was one of the reasons why it's really important that we were able to show that there's a lot of black Muslim in various fields who are thriving in their field, are professional, are expert. I mentioned about the MPs. You know, people don't often see black Muslims in as experts, but you have 18 MPs in parliament that are Muslims. And okay. you have in the field of sport, you have, you have Muslims there. In education, the same thing. So across the field, we're experts. So we want to showcase that, of course, we're being discriminated, but it's showcasing our expertise and documenting our lived experience. That's why the report is important. Yeah. Hassan, you know, on that lived experience, what the black Muslim community go through is unique. Their lived the experience is unique. Uh, what you learn, What have you learned from the report? Yeah, <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, first of all, um, thank you to the British Muslim TV um, for um, engaging on this really important topic. I'm um, uh, born Muslim of an Arab background myself. Um, and it was actually really eye-opening to read parts of th th this report, which um, it's titled, entitled Race, Faith and Community in Contemporary Britain. Um, and, and as you rightfully began with, we're such a diverse community in Britain in general. And then when you look at Muslims in Britain, we're one of the most diverse faith groups, if not the most diverse faith group 
um, in Britain from all colors, so many different countries in the world, etc. Um, and uh, often Islam is seen um, through, you know, perhaps a Western lens, if you could say, as a South Asian, because the majority of Muslims in the UK are of South Asian heritage. Mm -hmm. But what this report personally um, raised faith and community in contemporary Britain taught me was the stories. At the end of the day, as Muslims, what is our, our holy book, the Quran? What is the Quran full of stories? It's one of the best ways to communicate, to share our knowledge and experiences with each other in an effective way so that we can, as the Quran says in Surah Hujarat, we created you in nations and tribes that you may want know one another, and we can educate ourselves about the Ummah and about how we are all um, uh, come from different communities, but we have one aim, one ambition in life, which is, of course, to serve our creator and sustainer. Now, Bilkis, we want to talk honestly about your experience and the experience of black Muslims. I have had, over the last 12 months, a number of programs where we've had black Muslims come on, tell their lived experience. What's your experience of racism? Let's just talk, firstly, within the Muslim community. Right. My experience within the Muslim community is quite powerful because I have lived in this country for over 41 years, so I've moved around. You don't look that um, old. Ca can you hear me? No, you just said you don't look that old. Okay. You have okay. 41 years. I think you, you were a lot younger than that, mashallah. Okay, thank you for the compliment. Um, my experience is, I think the very first time I said to somebody about 15 years ago that I was a magistrate, it was as if, really? Did you make that up? And it, and their reaction was, uh, I bet they only chose it because they needed the numbers. And that was quite powerful because I'm somebody that I've moved across <laughs> different parts of the country. I've lived in you know, a different part of the country now that I'm settled in London. And, you know, again, working as a manager, people look down upon you because, A, you know, I'm black, I'm Muslim, and I have the Nigerian heritage in me. And so you have that combination, which is powerful, that, you know, you have a manager who's a Muslim, but do they really trust them? You know, even though I have the experience behind me, I've, I've been in public service over 35 years. So you have a combination of things you're always fighting, not just your religion, your heritage, your, you know, your, your, the fact that I'm Muslim, the fact that I'm my gender, you're all constantly battling against that. And it is somebody that I am somebody that if, if I wasn't confident and matured enough to be able to fight over it, um, it would be really dis so destroying. Mm. And that's one of the reasons I do a lot of community work to reassure the younger generation that th there are things out there we can do to reduce discrimination, to reduce the anti-blackness that we suffer from. So it is something that is ongoing and I hope by documenting what we've done with the report, it will show that there are things we can do together to, er to eradicate discrimination. Um, it is something that, you know, I hope in, in about five years' time, we'll be talking mm -hmm. on a different partner. Because for me, I have experienced it. It's ongoing. We continue to see. I mean, the recent event, you know, you, I, 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 recent, recent event in Nottingham is something that is quite powerful that, you know, somebody's ass can be burned down. So I am somebody that, you know, I always want to see that, yes, there's racism, discrimination, but how do we, I focus on the solution, how do we overcome it? Because okay. it's something that we need to do. Yeah. I'm, I'm, Hassan, let me ask you that, because this, this is about you and me and our community um, in terms of the South Asian and the Arab community. When I read, read the report, when I hear the lived experience, surely it's an opportunity for us to reflect on our own failures as a community and the prejudice that we have when it comes to the black community? I mean, uh, absolutely, Brother Muhammad. I mean, um, the report is a, is a collection of essays. Over 40 different authors um, across the UK of so many different backgrounds sharing their stories from um, an economic perspective, jobs, employment, from an arts and heritage perspective, from a sports perspective. We've got one sister who is um, a fully qualified um, referee with the FA, very young, mashallah, um, and uh, from a Somali background. Um, so really telling their story, their journeys. Um, and uh, these are untold stories. Um, and often when we look at the media, when we look at um, the representation of Muslims in the public space, we often only see South Asian or those of Arab heritage. Um, and we should ask ourselves, well, um, what about our black 
Muslim brothers and sisters, those from an African and Afro-Caribbean heritage. Um, I think there's also other things that we can be reflecting upon. In our day-to-day -day lives, if we frequent, for example, our local masjid, um, and we know that in our masjid, a wide variety of members of the community take part and pray at that masjid from Pakistani mm -hmm. or Indian mm -hmm. or Somali or West African background, but yet the management committee or the management team might only be of um, Arab or South Asian background, and there's no one from the black community represented on the management committee. You know, what can we do about that? What kind of positive change can we um, ask, push for? So, so what, uh, what is the sorry, Hassan, what, what is the MCB doing? What in terms of your membership organisation? Because you're a your umbrella organisation, you've got hundreds of organisations that uh, affiliate to you. What what are you telling your affiliates? Absolutely. Well, this is the starting point. And I wanted to come on to it a bit later, but you've you brought it on now. This is about changing mindsets. Um, we have to acknowledge that if there are legacy structures from our community, the second, third generation um, who are now getting involved, taking on leadership roles in our messages, in our institutions, like the MCB itself is simply a reflection of the community, um, they need to be aware that there's different um, social realities. There's different expectations. Um, many of our younger generation um, think of themselves as Muslim first, Bengali second, for example, whereas in perhaps the parents or older generation, it was the other way around. Um, mm. But that granted, MCB since day one uh, in the 1990s, it has had um, a representation from the West African um, and Afro-Caribbean communities mm -hmm. from its founding um, days. Um, mm -hmm. And we are continuing, obviously, we are committed to strengthening that and to widening that pool. Um, and Sister Bil Bilkis and others are part of the leadership team. And mm -hmm. that's something that we have to lead by example and say, this is what MCB is doing. Now, can we we want to be able to inspire other members of the community um, to say, what about what you're doing in your local communities, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Thank you so much. We've got about 60 seconds, but Bilkis, I just wanted to ask you uh, on that. I mean, how does it feel, because you're leading this, you're chairing this, you're fronting this campaign, how important mm -hmm. is that? It's very important because I, I, I really, like I said, uh, like what Asana said, MCB is leading on this, and we're working with MCB across the community because we have to work together to showcase what we can do. And I think that's the key for working together to change mindset, like Brother Hassan said, because it's a okay. starting point for us to do that. I'm going to stop you there. You, I know Hassan and uh, Bilkis, you're going to stay with us because we're going to take a very short break, our final break of the program. And then, inshallah, we'll continue this very important conversation, reflecting our own character and our own prejudice and our own needs. How representative and reflective are we of society? Maybe it's a reflection that we should be talking uh, about ourselves as well. Don't be going anywhere. We'll be back very shortly after this. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Single Muslim Live here on British Muslim TV. Before you get into that relationship, you need to be completely content with yourself. Areas in our, in our lives that need adjusting and that adjusting leads to healing. You using your emotional intelligence to understand other people. These are really tough topics but really needed to be spoken about. When I joined SingleMuslim.com I honestly wouldn't have dreamt that I would meet someone that I would marry and fall in love with. With my free membership, I was able to browse through thousands of single Muslim women in my area and read their profiles. So thank you SingleMuslim.com for helping me complete my faith. Alhamdulillah, I found the one. Thank you so much SingleMuslim.com for making this happen. मुझे नालों वासा की नाले आज गोठ में रहता हूँ बरसात बहुत ज़्यादा पाई घर बुड़ी या बच्चा वटी भगा से सिर्फ बच्चा ही भगा से कुछ न बच्चों जायूं क्रीपियों कच्चों हूँ पेट ढवला है तासिक काऊं मानी करें अच्छे थी करें न थी अच्छे करें खाएं ता बच्चा करें न था खाएं लट्टा निपना खानी भगा बस तरतबा थी वह खटा भी कान है ने कुछ भी कान है बेवाहा थी ने लगता हूँ घर खाऊं ऐसा के इधर वारं दाल दिनी चावर दिना हूँ गेहूँ दिना हूँ खंड चाय दिना हूँ साबुन तेल दिना आता हूँ पेस्ट यूनियन आता हूँ बच्चे ने जा तोलिया दिना आता हूँ जो कि तड़क कराया सा साफ़ करे वहाँ यूं 
गिरा देना ताऊ हर चीज़ अरे नहीं ताऊ साथी Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq, exclusively here on British Muslim TV, wherever you are around the world. We hope you found the uh, program interesting tonight. My special guest this evening is Bill Keys Savage. Um, I'm glad I got that name wrong. Uh, I, sorry, I'm, I'm glad that I got the name right, is Bill Keys Savage, but it's just spelled uh, differently because that, again, is the culture and the diversity, alhamdulillah, of our community. Uh, Hassan Jodi is here as well. Um, Hassan, I don't know if I can come to you now, but when the report was... Oh, you're both back. Excellent. So l l let's start with you, Hassan, there. Uh, when the re report was compiled, how much resources have the MCB put behind this? Like a lot of organisations, we wish we can provide more. Yeah, obviously. Um, but a lot of, and like a lot of what the MCB does, it is led by volunteers. Um, we have a small team of staff who, who support where they can. Um, but as with a lot of our community, this is volunteer-led, and we've been very fortunate to have a lot of goodwill, a lot of support from across the community to contribute mm. um, these essays over from 40 authors into this um, compilation of race, faith, um, and community in contemporary Britain. I think we've also been very fortunate to have had a, a kind of a, a very strong um you know, partnership uh, with some fantastic community organizations uh, such as the Black Muslim Forum, um, Everyday Muslims, um, the Salam Project, um, uh, Muslim Association of Nigeria, uh, and many messages, and even some of the universities as well, um, SOAS and the Center for African Studies. So it's been a real, I think, um, team effort, uh, and everyone has made a, a their valuable contribution and, and in many ways mcb has, has only really played a, a forum to bring everyone together but it, it's all there in the community and everyone's got that expertise and knowledge and um that's hopefully a role that we can continue to play in the community and in as best as way we can inshallah um bill keys when what did the report identify for you because when i read those stories i was deeply moved and empowered by that when you read those when you met those people and you compile this report what were the key issues uh, that black Muslims are facing? Well, I mean, the key issues black Muslims are facing are discrimination that has been mentioned and is still going on, and the size of the problem and the lack of data uh, to uh, uh, to document the, the, the fact that racism is a key issue within our community. And, you know, those contributors came across from many fields, and the fact they were able to document the issues and for us, the report is celebrating celebrating their achievement as well. So the key issue is still ongoing. Discrimination is a key issue. The anti-blackness is a big issue as well, as been mentioned. Um, and sometimes we don't often talk about that in our community that, you know, black Muslims sometimes are seen as inferior to the mainstream Muslims. And that was another main issue within our community. And again, grateful that the MCB has taken a key lead in, you know, giving us the opportunity to do this report. Um, for, for me, I think it's going to be a beginning of a journey to document the issues and the fact that we we work together, as been said by, by the Deputy General uh, Asan, that we work together with our community to to solve some of the problems that we need to solve because for the sake of the younger generation, it's really important that the, we talk about discrimination that we face. Uh, we are a key significant number of population in this country. And the fact that, you know, we are still experiencing discrimination and the anti-blackness is, is the main issue. I never imagine you know in this day and age we're still facing that and i do hope more of the the contribution of black muslims this can be celebrated in future yeah that's really important i mean hassan uh really important uh powerful stories that you are telling here when you look out to islamophobia awareness month what what your what is your message to the mainstream media and people who are perpetuating islamophobia um we we are one ummah as muslims and we are also part of this society um our nation britain um and it is down to us to take a participatory participatory an active role in that 
despite the challenges. And we know just like the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, in Mecca and then the Hijrah to Medina, faced immense challenges in his life. Uh, I was reading a biography the other day, and subhanAllah, every time you read it from a different author, you just think, you know, how many of us would have just given up? And yet the perseverance that our Prophet, peace be upon him, taught us and inspired that community in the 23 years of his prophethood um, uh, is, lives on to this day 1400 years later. So if we look at the challenges that we face in terms of Islamophobia um, uh, across society, in that context, perhaps that's one way to to lift us up and to inspire us. But at the same time, as well as looking outwards and challenging and helping wider society to understand the challenges that we face as Muslims, we need to also look inwards and say, well, uh, in terms of Islamophobia, we may be victims at times, many of us, but are we inadvertently making others victims or mm -hmm. oppressing others accidentally through our prejudice, through um, attitudes, through even um, you know unintentionally saying comments which may um, uh, offend people or which may come across in the wrong way. Um, and how can we make sure that we are aware um, of the diversity in our community, such as uh, from uh, our Muslim brothers and sisters uh, from the African and Afro-Caribbean mm -hmm. communities, um, but also even beyond that, uh, let us make sure that we are not oppressors ourselves. And when we are oppressed, we respond to it with dignity, with beauty, and in the same way that our Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, would have wanted us to do so. Because actually, you know, Hassan, just on that, I mean, MCB, when it, uh, it's had Dawood Abdullah, who was uh, Deputy Secretary General, who was, who's black. Uh, you've got a woman, mashallah, and Zara Mohammed, mashallah. And so there is, you, you, you have some elements of diversity, but where is the strong black Muslim women? I mean, I know she, um, Bilkis is chair of uh, this particular initiative, but surely your institutions also need to be re reflective. Completely agree, and that's actually some part of the recommendations of the report. And the re report makes recommendations uh, for all, um, community organizations, messages, youth centers, um, women's groups, etc. and makes recommendations to the charitable sector, your big kind of um, NG INGOs, and makes recommendations for representative organizations, such as you know, MCB being one of them. So we have to also, and we are, um, in the process of exploring what is going to what it's going to look like in 2023 to implement more of the recommendations of the report inshallah and like with everything you have to start with yourself charity starts at home uh, and self-reflection um, and you know um, improvement starts at home as well before you can lecture and talk to anyone else about it uh bill Keese, when you look back at your life the 41 years that you've been here and all the work that you've done how do and what lessons have you learned from your life that the Muslim women watching this, my four daughters at home are watching this, that they can apply to their lives uh, and make a difference. You're on mute. Oh, engagement, there we are. engagement and collaboration. We have to continue to engage. With, with, in order to have cohesion in our community, we have to continue to engage. It's really important, we Muslims, Despite the racism and discrimination, we have to continue to engage and collaborate to achieve that representation. And for me, I've been fortunate to be in key position, leading a proud Muslim organization, being a manager, being a magistrate. I did that through working hard to be part of the community, to engage, to collaborate. I was able to achieve that. And that is the message I want to put across that. Yes, it's difficult. Yes, it will be hard at times. You face obstacle but you must not give up be confident be resilient and persevere and as Allah has thought of Sabru is really important through that and with prayers we will study it. but it's through engagement collaboration and working with that community to achieve cohesion is really really important um Hassan when we look back at the Islamic history uh the time of the Sahaba the blessed Ahlul Bayt um w which personality stands out for you that we can take inspiration today? Wow, what a question. Um, I, I remember, so part of the Proudly Muslim and Black uh, project has also been doing workshops. We um, It was started during COVID. They were called racial justice workshops. Yeah. Um, and and um, there was, uh, and we're hoping, inshallah, we can do more of those in the future. And that was actually some of the similar questions, reminding people that it's not just Bilal, alayhi salam from the Prophet's companions, but there are many others um, who perhaps are not so well known in Islamic history. But well, maybe my take on this would be would be this. Of course, we know that um, 
one of the first um, Muslim, before the Hijra, um, as you know, the Prophet peace be upon him, asked some of the Muslim, earlier Muslim community to emigrate. Where to? Um, to um, Abyssinia. Yeah, Abyssinia. Uh, and of course, who was there to hear their story of persecution um, and to give them safe haven from the Quraysh? Uh, of course, it was the Abyssinian king uh, from African black background, etc. And so perhaps, you know, um, in the spirit of interfaith week as well, which was last week, uh, it remind, reminding us of our bonds of friendship with our fellow um, faith communities, um, and at the end of the day, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is our Lord and Creator who uh, inspires us, um, and wherever you are from the world, when, when there's um, values there, such as protecting people and sanctity, etc., then these are the kinds of things that need to continue to inspire us going forward. Well, uh, thank you so much for being my uh, special guest this evening. Thank you so much, uh, Bill Key Savage and Hassan Jory. And we'll keep an eye on this and looking forward to welcoming and showcasing some of those stories in the report. Uh, hopefully get some of them here in the studio so we can share their lived experience. Thank you so much, Bill Key Savage and Hassan Jody. Thank you Jody. so much for giving uh, us the opportunity. Thank you so much. The honour is all ours. Uh, joining us uh, there from London, best wishes for the future. And as I said, we're going to keep a close eye on that report. We're going to try to get some of those people who've been featured so that we can showcase that talent. Because that's, in the essence, what my programme is all about. It's about showcasing the best of the Muslim world. Predominantly British Muslim, because it's British Muslim TV, but also actually around the world. And that's, uh, alhamdulillah, uh, what we try to do here on my programme. I hope you benefit from it. I hope you have benefited from it. Um, if you have, please remember to pray for the team here at British Muslim TV. Uh, thank you so much uh, to my special guests um, who were joining us. Bilki Savage, Hassan Jody were joining us there from London, the from Muslim Council of Britain. We've reached the end of another programme. Where did the time go? First, I want to thank our special guests tonight, um, Mark Slater, Saik and Naz, uh, Bilki Savage and Hassan Jody. If you were waiting for the discussion about Islamophobia and the rise of... Um, Indian extremism uh, in the United States. We are having some connection issues with that. Um, we will uh, hopefully return to that in a future show. We'll be back next week with another edition of Questions with life stories from those making a difference to communities around the world. You know, in essence, we are good because we are Muslim. We are good because we are good human beings. If that's what we can do, Everything, inshallah, will be good. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great, week, great weekend when it comes. From me, Mohammed Shafiq, and the whole team here at British Muslim TV, thank you for joining us. Take care of yourself and each other. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.